This is Teresa Br Brassfield. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay. Teresa is the Region 4 Environmental Program Coordinator, and she's going to talk about everything environmental. Okay, I'll try to keep facing the microphone and not turning away, but I have a really soft voice, so if anyone can't hear me at any time, like right there if I step back, just make a noise, and I'll try to repeat what I said. Okay, as... Uh, as you said, my name is Teresa Brassfeld. I work in Region 4. Um, I'm one of multiple environmental coordinators throughout the state, and I have been with ODOT for 17 years, nine months, and one day. I count every day now. <laughs> okay, as I said, each region has at least two RECs. If you don't know who your REC is, Region Environmental Coordinator, you need to find out who that person is, and you need to develop a really close working relationship with them. Um, they're gonna be your go-to from cradle to grave on a project. Um, we're responsible for coordinating all environmental clearances, and like I said, from planning all the way through to construction, all the way through to maintenance, and monitoring for years after. So, as I said, when should you involve a rec on a project? As soon as you know there is one. Basically, you have an idea you're given a scoping list, 150% list, and you're responsible for the scoping reports. Get that rec involved so early and so in depth as soon as possible. So what do we need from you guys? So if we're kicking a project off, basic needs. We need a key number, we need a project name, and most importantly, we need a federal aid number. NEPA is all about federal aid numbers. So we can't even begin our documentation for clearances until we have that number. And I'm going to skip through my notes here for a second. Okay, environmental timelines, I'll touch real quick on this, and then we'll get into more detail on how long things actually do take on the slides that come up. But in general, NEPA takes, if it's a categorical exclusion, and we'll talk about categories too, and I'm going to jump all over the place because environmental is just a mishmash. I mean, there is no straight line or straight path through. I mean, you could have two paving projects. They're completely different. They've got different timelines. And you're going to see that environmental is actually a really complicated field, and there's so many parties that have interest in it that it is never straightforward. So generally, we need about a year from DAP. So just keep that in mind when you're establishing schedules. And then we'll talk about it on some further slides that there are certain um, discipline areas that you may have a DAP set in August. That's not going to work for them. Uh, we need bare ground, we need blooming, you know, flowering seasons. Environmental is so timing specific for certain areas that your schedule may look good from a design standpoint, but it just won't work for environmental. And that's not to say that, you know, we tend to get the bad rep and everybody's like, oh, God, environmental again, you know. Um, but it's just, you know, we're held by federal law and state law, and there are some times that we just can't be flexible on dates. So just keep that in mind, work with your rec and really, really take their advice when they're giving you, you know, schedule recommendations up front. Okay, NEPA. What is NEPA? So National Environmental Policy Act passed in 1969, and the whole purpose of it was so that federal agencies would take into consideration what impacts the projects were going to have on the environment. It's not just natural environment, but it's also social, socio and economic as well. So where there's a federal nexus or a FHWA nexus, which is the majority of ODOT projects, we're gonna follow Federal Highway's NEPA process. However, if it's a federal agency, odds are they have their own NEPA process. And depending on the level of impact on the project, if we're on another federal agency's property, we may end up having to negotiate with them to use our own process or we'll have to follow theirs. So that's another thing that can really trip up a timeline for a project is when you have multiple federal agencies that have an interest. Also, um, keep in mind, a lot of local projects may not have federal dollars involved, but there could still be a federal nexus that would trigger NEPA. Um, good example are a lot of projects that uh, local governments choose to take that dollar switch, you know, the money match is what it's called. And they may think that, oh, if we don't have the federal dollars involved, it'll be an easier process. But then they trigger a need for a permit from like Corps of Engineers. 
then you're going to be involved in another agency's NEPA process, and it can get really convoluted really quick. So just keep in mind that even though if there's no federal dollars, it doesn't mean that you're NEPA free. As I mentioned, you know, the odds of having multiple federal agencies involved can be pretty high. Um, sometimes you're going to have projects that go across Forest Service, say we have an easement. It doesn't mean that we don't involve Forest Service at all because there are certain agreements that were in place in that easement that dictate who has lead over the NEPA and the environmental. And even though you know, Federal Highways may be delegated as the lead agency on that project, we still have to meet all the Forest Service plan objectives, which means we have to have a decision memo or a letter of consent from those agencies before we can complete our own NEPA. So just keep in mind that you, know, when you have multiple federal agencies involved, and this includes you know, tribal governments as well. Um, everybody has their own way of doing things, and sometimes they really don't align. So we're going to have to spend a little bit of extra time from an environmental standpoint just to make sure that we're meeting all, this is cutting in and out, meeting all, now you can hear me, of the agency's expectations. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you know you have a project that's going to be on Forest Service, BLM, tribal lands, get them involved really early. Um, don't wait until late in the game because they could throw you know, a curveball at you from a, an easement standpoint or uh, we may be thinking that we're meeting their requirements based on federal highways guidelines and they could have something completely different. Um, their timelines can be stretched a little bit longer than ours. If we have to go through their process, they can take nine months to a year and we can't do ours until we have theirs complete. So just keep that in mind as well. Kind of touched on that just now. Um, subject areas, like I said, environmental is just a mishmash of a ton of different areas that we have to take into consideration. And, you know, there's, there's so many different requirements and they don't always align. So when your rec is looking at a project and potential impacts, we could have something from, uh, say, ODFNW, a requirement over here that doesn't quite align with what National Marine Fisheries would want. And so there's a lot of negotiation that happens behind the scenes between different regulatory agencies that have to be met before we can even you know, resolve the issue and get an agreement for our NEPA documentation. So um, keep in mind also, you know, these are kind of the obvious ones, biological resources, water quality, but we also have to look at the impact of relocation. So if you have a right-of-way relocation, we're looking at it from a socioeconomic standpoint, from an environmental justice standpoint. Um, we're also looking at it from you know, a historic standpoint. Is that building that we're taking is it got a significance to you know, the, the local community? Is it something that is a listed historic property? So it gets really complicated fast. And you know, I can't reiterate enough, and you'll hear this in a lot of different trainings, involve your rec. I mean, get to know them, get to know them early on in a project. Um, some of the other things that we're starting to look at, um, believe it or not, in global warming and, ga and greenhouse gas emissions, we're starting to really take a close look at that and how our projects are having impacts. So it's just something that's going to be rolling out a little bit um, more in the future as far as regulations for projects. And then just keep in mind, FHWA's NEPA process is just this overarching umbrella, and we've got everything underneath it. And you know, environmental investigations, reviews, consultations have to be coordinated as a single process, which is where you know, getting that, that rec involvement early is great when you have multiple agencies that have an interest. And it's really important that we keep those strong relationships and then the um, history of the regulations and the legislation has to be kept in the forefront because environmental regulations change constantly. I mean, we're, we're always getting updates. Most of the time they're in our benefit, but they can be a setback if you're farther along in project development. Until you actually break ground, if something changes in environmental law, we have to go back and redo our work. So just keep that in mind. Um, we don't have that happen very often, but it is a reality sometimes. So in the past, we did things rather different. Um, we kind of broke up project development and were really compartmentalized. And it really wasn't the best way to go forward with environmental. Uh, we need to be you know, environmentally informed in our decision making all throughout the process. And it's important to understand that the NEPA process doesn't begin, or the environmental process doesn't begin or end with NEPA. Um, compliance with environmental laws, it's all throughout. So it's you know, through planning. We want environmentally informed planning so that 
we can move a planning document into scoping, into a project, and not have to go back and redo work. And then the same for all, you know, all of the different processes and all the different stage gates during project development. We want to make sure that we're checking in with that rec and making sure that we're still on the same path that we thought we were at the beginning so that we don't end up with surprises at the end. So I mentioned NEPA documents. The majority of our projects are what we call uh, categorical exclusions, and underneath that we have had the benefit of our partnership with Federal Highways to have what's called a programmatic CADEX, and I'm sure you guys have known PCEs. So the benefit of the, the PCE is when a part three, which was our, our prospectus, is done, you can do the PCE determination. As long as you're meeting the criteria that were agreed upon with Federal Highways, and that PCE determination is able to be agreed upon and you can sign off on that, federal dollars for right-of-way can be authorized and it can be done as soon as project kickoff. So really important to know what your scope is and to provide that information to your REC. If it can't be a programmatic CADEX um, and it's a regular CADEX because there's a kick out and we'll go through a couple of those later, then we can't authorize federal dollars for right-of-way until that categorical exclusion is done, and that means all of the other environmental documentation has to be done. So the benefit of that PCE agreement is you can get the authorization up front and do the work afterwards. A CE, you have to wait. And usually it's going to be late in the game, advanced plans, final plans, sometimes even ps &E. So, you know, keeping that information path forward with your REC is really important. The other two categories are an environmental assessment and also um, an EIS. We don't have very many of these anymore, so I'm gonna to touch really quick on the next few slides. Um, but as I said, you know, a CADEX, 99% of our projects are CADEXs, and it's basically something that is not gonna have a significant effect on the human environment. Um, First and foremost, you know, projects, you have to try to avoid the impacts, minimize them, and mitigate. And as long as you can come to a conclusion that you're not having a significant impact, you can process it as a CADEX, and it's a pretty short document. Environmental assessments, these are when you don't really know what your impacts are going to be. Um, like I said, we used to do a lot of these, but with the agreements that we have in place with Federal Highways and better understanding what our impacts are, we don't have very many of these anymore. Um, a benefit of an environmental assessment is it can really give you a little bit more background so that you know that you, you truly do have a CADEX, and from a legal standpoint, um, it just gives you a little bit more teeth in the future. Environmental impact statements, these are our largest documents. These can get really lengthy, really expensive, really fast. And, you know, it's when there's a major federal action, um, one of the latest example that I'm working on has been North Corridor, if everybody knows about that. That's the realignment of 97 and 20 north of Bend. Um, that is a huge undertaking that Federal Highways has been involved in for several years. And then, you know, keep in mind that when we're saying significant, um, there really is no recipe for that. It's up to individuals to decide based on your surveys and your environmental documentation. But even $1 can mean a major action. So just keep that in mind. Um, your REC's your most valuable resource once again. NEPA does have a shelf life. So before you take further action on a draft or a final document, you need to make sure it's still valid. So having your REC check in with Federal Highways. General rule of thumb is three years. If you haven't taken any action on a document in three years, have your REC take another look at it. Um, action can mean just taking a small part of that project and doing it, and that keeps your NEPA document alive. So just be aware of when you do your projects that you do have a shelf life, keep track of that, and it'll keep that document going. So in order to make NEPA efficient, like I said, get involved in your planning efforts, engage your environmental staff really early, um, engage interested parties. If anyone has an interest in a project, Federal Highways wants to see them included in your coordination efforts. It's not to say that they have any kind of regulatory authority, but we do need to address concerns in every class of NEPA documentation. Also manage that scope creep and alternatives. Make sure your REC is fully involved. It doesn't matter, you know, you may think it's such a small change, but it could have huge implications from an environmental standpoint. And then I touched on federal mitigation policy. So we are required by law to avoid impacts if possible, minimize, preserve is the next step down, rectify, repair, and then compensate. So we have to consider them in that sequence, avoid first, minimize second. And then we are required by law to carry through mitigation commitments through design, construction, and monitoring and maintenance. 
and there may be life cycle management. So we may revisit the same issue on you know, additional projects in the future, but we are still required to meet the recommendations and the requirements from that first uh, initial project. So you know, you, we're getting into times where we're doing projects in the same corridor after you know, pavement design is another good example. Um, pavement preservations may not be the same. I mean, we, we have projects where we've, we're paving the same road for three times and every single time the environmental requirements are different because we have obligations from past jobs that we have to still implement. So just keep that in mind as well. Um, other requirements, now we're gonna get into, as I said, other federal agency NEPA, tribal NEPA, um, we're not the only agency with an interest. So just once again, just keep that in mind. Um, we may be required to wait for other agencies to complete their own processes. So meat and potatoes NEPA, we have Section 4F. Um, Section 4F is it's proposed mainly to protect public um, parks and recreation lands, and it was established as a provision of the Department of Transportation Act. So unless Federal Highways has an involvement, you don't have to address Section 4F. If you do have a Section 4F property, and once again, it's a public park and recreation land, it has to be publicly owned, public park, and the major purpose of it is for parks and recreation. So you have to show that there's no feasible or prudent alternative to impacting that property. And we can do temporary occupancy. There's a whole bunch of different ways that we can negotiate through 4F. But the main uh, message here is that we are required to try to avoid, and sometimes cost is not an issue when you're looking at considerations for avoidance. So it's not really a weighted scale. It's based on the significance and the importance of that property within the community. Section 6F, this one can get a little tricky. It is still associated with more than anything parks and recreation lands, but it's land and water conservation funds. And what these were developed for was to um, kind of an assistance matching program for improvements on public lands. If your project is impacting a project, a property that has section 6F lands or money tied to them, um, you're in for a long haul. We are required to mitigate in kind for property impacts when you have a 6F property. And it can take, we have projects that have been under uh, review for years, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, 10 years or more. It's not gonna hold your project up per se, but you're still required to complete that process. It could be as simple as you know a 25 cent O-ring on a valve. If you trigger it, the whole property is considered a 6F property, not just the feature that the money was used for. So very important to identify those up front as well. Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. This is archeology span historic, and everybody knows how difficult it can be to get through this process and how time consuming it is. Um, there's a lot of key players involved in this. It's not just our State Historic Preservation Office, but it's also the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the tribes have an interest, National Park Service, Federal Highways, and We've been lucky, we do have a programmatic agreement in place that Federal Highways has established for us, and as long as we're meeting certain conditions, uh, we can process a project through this programmatic, and a lot of times we can just do a spreadsheet entry. Um, it's as simple as our archeologist or our historian saying, yeah, we meet criteria A. It goes into a spreadsheet, it's annually reviewed by Federal Highways and the SHPO, and then we can continue with our clearances. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that there is a required 30-day consultation period with the tribes and a 30-day review period by the SHPO, so we need to make sure that we have enough time built into our schedules for those. Sorry, I went too far. There we go. Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. This is mainly administered by Corps of Engineers, and so if we're placing material, not removal, but if you're placing any material in what they consider a waters of the U.S., then they claim jurisdiction over that and we have to meet certain criteria. They do have what are called nationwide permits and these are programmatically approved upfront activities so that you don't have to go through individual consultations. So if you're meeting the conditions within these, these nationwide permits, um, it's a pretty straightforward job and you can do like, uh, it's a 30 day completeness review, 45 days to issue a permit. So within you know two and a half months you could have your Permit, which is a required document for your NEPA. If you 
do not meet the criteria for those nationwides, you're into a situation where you have an individual permit needed, and that can take up to a year. One of the benefits of those nationwides is that the negotiations with DEQ for Clean Water Act certification has been done up front. It's part of that nationwide permit, so you don't have additional documentation or review time. Most of the projects are going to be underneath that nationwide, so you know your timing is, is going to be critical if you're late in your project and getting your removal fill quantities identified. So just keep that in mind. If you're impacting the waters of the state, if you've consulted with your rec, you need to build at least three months in for permits, and most of the time we don't submit until advanced plans because if you resubmit, it's starting the clock over again. So just keep that in mind. Another agency that's going to regulate within waters of the state in the U.S. is the Department of State Lands. And where they're different than core is that they also regulate removal of material. There are some thresholds that you can get uh, applied to your project where you don't have to get a permit. And if you're within a waterway that's not considered an essential salmonid habitat, then there is a 5,000 cubic yard uh, threshold, or 50 cubic yard threshold, excuse me, that's exempt from a permit. So work with your rec and really identify what the impacts are gonna be below that ordinary high line. DSL permit times can take uh, 45 days. Uh, if you have to do an individual permit, you can have up to 120 days for that turnaround. And then keep in mind, if you do a design change, we're resubmitting and that timeline starts over again. Land use is one of the uh, Areas that's still a little bit gray when it comes to NEPA. Uh, most of our projects, if they need a goal exception or a land use action, have, it's already occurred during the planning phase. If we run into this during project development, this is one of the kickouts of that PCE agreement. So if you need a goal exception during project development, we're not going to be able to process that NEPA until we have that goal exception in hand, which means you're going to be closer to the end of your project development cycle before you can get your NEPA documentation completed. Section 7 of ESA, um, Endangered Species Act. So we're really lucky in that we have what's called, everybody's heard the word FAP. So it's a federal aid highway programmatic that we have in place with, but with National Marine Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And what we did is negotiated up front what our impacts are going to be from our projects. And as long as we're meeting those criteria, we can process a project underneath the FAP. And the timeline savings is extreme. Um, once you know what your project is and you know what the impacts are gonna be and that it qualifies for the FAP, you're looking at about a six week project timeline from start to finish of having your clearance. In the past, those same uh, project impacts that are negotiated under the FAP had to have a biological assessment produced for them. It could take up to six months, some of them took up to a year. So this is something that is really valuable and it's really critical that we um, keep our design criteria you know, within that when we can. It's not to say that we're obligated to use it, but it's a really handy tool. We do have other regulations outside of Endangered Species Act that we have to take into account. Um, fish passage statute, this is kind of a, it's a difficult one. Um, a lot of the district ODFNW offices have different, differing opinions than the Salem office, so really negotiate up front with your rec and your biologists. Migratory Bird Treaty Act, this one's gonna have a huge impact on construction schedules mainly, but when you're building your project schedule for bid let, just keep in mind that if you're doing anything that's gonna affect a migratory bird nesting season, which is March 1st through August 31st, we do have a permit, but we're required to try to avoid impacts out, you know, within that timeline. So keep that, you know, if you've got a, a project that's gonna take a lot of timber down, see if you can let a contract ahead of time. Um, negotiate with the agencies. Some, some projects are big enough that we're actually getting individual migratory bird uh, permits for them so that we can really negotiate the timelines that are most efficient for a project. Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act is another one. Um, bald eagles are no longer listed underneath the Endangered Species Act, but in a way, um, this, this act is, a, is more restrictive than the ESA. There is no take under this act, um, so just keep in mind you know, we may have additional timeline restrictions on this. Nesting season generally can range between December 1st, January 1st, all the way through July 15th. So when you're building your project schedule and you have known bald and e golden eagle nesting in the area, you're gonna have timing restrictions that are gonna come on that back end of project development. Um, state ESA applies. We work with Oregon Department of Agriculture on that. In water work periods this is another big one. Um, ODFNW has established these periods for when the fish are less likely to be within a system, and that's when we're allowed to work in them. They vary greatly throughout the state. 
Um, when you're building your schedule, keep in mind if you have a bridge project or culvert project or anything that's going to impact below ordinary high, these in water work periods are really going to dictate your construction season. Um, some of them are really, really short. We can get extensions, but we need to know up front what level of effort we need for that project. Botanical clearances, uh, you're building a schedule. We do have the ability to do what we call a habitat assessment. So you don't have to go out during the flowering season if the habitat is not there for potential endangered species. But lots of times we need another season. Um, if you're letting your project, your project's kicking off in the fall and there's a potential for habitat for an endangered plant, we're gonna be asking for the surveys to be conducted the following year. So you know, we may be asking for that schedule to be pushed out a bit so that we can definitively make that call. Wildlife passage, uh, there was just a bill passed in the latest legislative session where we're gonna be required to start evaluating the potential to put wildlife passage features within projects. Um, it's gonna be a, a big push in the future. Uh, it's a very, very expensive effort. Um, we're working on some south of Bend right now where we're evaluating two wildlife undercrossings and then first overcrossing in the state. And we're trying to find ways to creatively fund those um, with Oregon Hunters Association, ODFNW, but just you know, be aware this is gonna become one of the hot topics moving forward that we're gonna to have to take a closer look at in project development. So air quality, we do have national ambient air quality standards we have to meet. There are seven air pollutants that have standards established. And based on that pollutant, EPA has de designated what we're calling non-attainment or maintenance areas. And non-attainment areas in Oregon are, there's not that really that many, but we have to keep in mind when you're having a project that's gonna affect traffic in a way that um, air quality could be impacted, uh, further work may be needed. Klamath Falls area, Oak Ridge, um, Lane County. Um, maintenance areas are those that have a history of non-attainment, but we're now meeting criteria, but it doesn't mean that we still don't have to do additional air quality work within those areas. And maintenance areas are Eugene Springfield, Grants Pass. So you may have further um, design criteria or uh, specifics for those standards that have to be met. It's not gonna be as straightforward a project as you may think based on where you're located. So noise projects are, they can be a little bit tricky. So there are federal type pro projects that are federal type one projects, and this is something Federal Highways refers to. You only trigger the requirement for a noise study if you have federal highways involvement. So if you're doing a new highway on a new location, you're altering the distance between a receptor, we may have the requirement to go out and do a noise study, and this can add some significant costs depending on availability of ODOT staff. Um, currently, we are kind of stretched on the ability to do the noise work internally. So most of the time, you're gonna see this work consulted out. Um, it can have an impact on your schedule, depending on how far along you are in design. We do need to know where center line of the new roadway is gonna be. And it can get quite expensive depending on the number of receptors and the number of points that they need to do a study uh, to, to collect data on. Uh, most noise studies can run between twenty and $60,000. They can go higher. So if you're requiring a noise study on a project, work with your rec and try to figure out exactly what you need to get them so that they can try to refine that level of effort as much as possible. Environmental justice. Um, the main thing with environmental justice is we're looking at not disproportionately affecting communities that give you a little history. So trailer parks, I'll just touch on that. So you have a mobile home park. It's pretty cheap land. And most of the time it is on a fringe of a project and it just looks like the most desirable place to go. And in the past, this tends to be what had happened. So environmental justice law requires us to look at avoiding those properties whenever possible. Um, it also does something with our transportation decision making that's actually a benefit. And it's, it's making better decisions that's gonna serve the community as a whole and not just you know, the traveling public and vehicles. We're looking at um, you know, bike ped facilities, um, transit opportunities. It's just something to keep in mind that can kind of balloon out from the original intent of a project. Socioeconomic, we have to, we're required by law to address the beneficial and the adverse effects. 
And one of the things with um, social impacts is if you're gonna be changing the neighborhood character or stability, if you're splitting them, um, if there's a community that's pretty tight knit from a cultural standpoint and you're putting a road through it, um, may not be the best idea. Um, you're changing travel patterns. Uh, if you're impacting highway and traffic safety, if you're having general impacts on certain social groups such as elderly, handicapped, we all need to, you know, those all need to be wrapped into your evaluation. And socioeconomic studies are generally consulted out and they can become quite expensive. So keep in mind, talk to your rec. Um, if a socioeconomic or an environmental justice community are identified up front, um, get on that early. Uh, planning phase is usually the best to really start addressing those issues. Hazmat, um, this one can get really in depth and really expensive quick. Um, corridor assessments are your best bet right off the bat. Have your hazmat coordinator go out, identify potentially hazardous materials. If they recommend doing some upfront testing, believe me, it's a lot cheaper than getting into construction and discovering something. Um, so, you know, take that initiative up front and have the, the additional survey work done. Um, decommissioning tanks, a lot of times um, we don't discover these until we're actually digging during construction, but if these are identified up front, we do have the option to go ahead and decommission, get rid of them, and then construction doesn't have to worry about them. We can also include them in the contract specifications if necessary. We have had projects where we thought we had gotten everything and we were digging the ground and we kept finding tank after tank after tank. Um, a lot of old gas stations, if they had a leaky tank, they just threw a new one in right next to it, hooked the hoses up, and they just kept going in a domino effect. Uh, we are required to trace out all of the contamination if it's originating in our right of way. So if that's discovered under construction, it can get quite expensive. It's a lot cheaper to deal with that up front. So Oregon has 26 federal and state scenic byways, highways, all American roads. Um, we do have a scenic byways program. And even though we, we have our own program, a lot of those byways are managed by other agencies such as Forest Service or BLM. And we're required to coordinate with them because they may have certain requirements for colors. Um, good example is on the Mount Hood, if you're going up and over on 26, we have to paint everything. The back of the signs have to be brown. Um, signposts have to be black. There's certain setbacks that we have to maintain, view sheds. Um, your rec can help you out with that. We also have designated wild and scenic rivers, and those are, once again, managed by either Forest Service, BLM, or Oregon State Parks. If we have a project that's within a half a mile of those, we have to take into account project impacts from a visual standpoint, and that can get really time consuming. Um, there's a whole separate project process that those agencies have for wild and scenic rivers, and it's a permit application that goes in. It can take six months. So we just need to make sure we build that time into our schedules. And if you haven't caught on, environmental is really a, it's a web of all these linked actions and can easily derail, cause project delays, unanticipated costs. And it's not to, you know, put fear mongering out there, but when changes aren't communicated, the project is really, really at risk. Even simple actions can have big consequences. And the number of regulations has increased sharply over the year, and they're just gonna consider, you know, continue to do so. And they're ever-changing, new requirements are rolling out. Some of them contradict other agencies. So just really rely on your rec and involve them, even with the tiniest changes. I mean, one of the things I always say is I am more than happy to take as much information as you want to give me. I'd rather know more than not enough and then run into a, a roadblock later or an issue. So summarizing. Um, Best practices, conduct detailed step scoping. If you're invo involved in scoping and you get something from environmental, just make sure to go through that. And if you have any questions, question your rec. I mean, we're more than happy to answer any questions, to take feedback, um, get to know what your issues are and ensure that the budget's gonna accommodate those needs. Don't find yourself, you know, in the future needing archeology span field work that wasn't identified up front. Um, archeology span is one of those things that we really don't have a lot of control over. Um, if we find something, it could be pretty simple. It could be cleared, you're done. Or we could be into a situation where you're looking at you know, a quarter million dollars to clear a project site under project development. So just keep in mind that even the smallest little change can have huge repercussions in your budget and your schedule. Ensure you've got good communication. Once I said, you know, get that rec involved, talk to them often, um, make sure that when you're reaching that DAP phase gate, that's really that where we get the most information that we can start submitting those permit applications and keeping things on schedule. 
and then manage that scope change and ensure that your rec is plugged in at all times. Um, as I said, even those little minor changes can have really lengthy permitting delays and unexpected costs. And then best advice, you know, as I've said, often and early, just communicate with your rec. And the more information you can give us, the better. And believe me, we, we bug us, we don't mind. So any questions? All right, a lot of information. So I know, I'll give you mine. Camera. And that was fast and I do apologize. This is actually therapy for me because I have a huge fear of talking in front of crowds. So that's one of the reasons why I took this, so I appreciate it. <laughs> So any questions? Uh, when environmental activities are consulted out, when in the project delivery life cycle should that contract be let and who should be involved in that review? So involve your rec right up front if you know that you're gonna have an issue where in, you know, we need to consult something out. Involve your rec in the scope of work. We do have templates that are available. The earlier you can get the rec involved and get those templates out, the better. Um, one of the things that we cannot consult out is Section 106 consultations, so we're still going to have a lot of oversight from a historic and archaeology standpoint. It's not to say that you can't consult the actual field work out, but we do have to do our own clearance documentation for that. Um, same thing for NEPA. We really prefer to keep all of our final NEPA documentation in-house. We could consult out a lot of the, the scoping effort, the Part 3, but when it comes to actually doing the NEPA documentation for clearances, we need to keep that with the REC. Um, coordinate often. We like to review all of the draft documents that come in um, and provide as much feedback as we can so that we don't end up with something that is, you know, last minute trying to fix and we're really pressed for time. So just involve your rec as early as possible and try to get those scopes of work done. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank you for listening to me stumble through. I appreciate it. Do you have a statement of work during planning for a planning phase? I'm sorry, I don't even... Do you... Oh, there you are. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my question is, do you have a statement of work, like a task, uh, that applies just for planning phase? For you know, I, I personally have never seen one. I'm sure there probably is, but I, no, I honestly no. don't know. Um, when it comes to the project development and the actual NEPA documentation and the discipline reports, there are standardized templates out there, but I don't know about planning. I didn't see anything on the website, so probably somebody need to look into this That's to good, avoid any confusing for the um, consultant. Can you rate that as a I will. Yeah, comment, definitely. Other questions? Kim? Um, so there's a lot of different environmental things. I'm wondering, is there like a process flow chart or a triggering flow chart? So for example, mm -hmm. I know that like a noise study, you need a noise study if you're going to widen a road. So that would be a trigger that would say, well, now I'm going to know, I know I'm going to need a noise study. But as far as scheduling, a lot of these things I think also can happen concurrently, but mm -hmm. just how do I know what elements I'm going to need? Talk to your rack. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but there are so many different triggers for survey needs. I mean, widening a road is one or adding a, an auxiliary lane. Just changing traffic signal timing can be a trigger. I mean, there's so many different nuances in environmental that you may not consider, and, and they, they change constantly, too. So the best advice I can give you is just coordinate with your rec as early as possible. Um, provide as much information up front in your business case so that they can get a really effective scoping report done. Um, but yeah, I mean, there really is no flow chart because there's so many off ramps in environmental. Um, one thing can trigger, you know, oh, well, we don't need to do this report, but because we've done something that's gonna eliminate the need for that survey, we've triggered another one, and then we trigger another one. So really there is no standard flow to environmental. Like I said, two projects that may look identical on paper are completely different once you get involved in them. 
Um, and I know that's kind of frustrating, and you'll hear that from your environmental staff. It's just like, we don't know. And a lot of times we don't until we really take a look at what those impacts are doing to other requirements. Um, we do have standard manuals. I mean, there, there are lots of good information in those that you can look at that, that kind of bullet out what the major triggers are for the need of a noise study or an air quality study or something like that. But there really is no standardized flow chart because it just is ever evolving. I think I know this one, but maybe others don't. What is required um, from environmental for the DAP phase gate? So the DAP phase gate, if you look at the checklist, it's always saying the, the design is at a point that environmental permits can be submitted. That's not always true at that point. A lot of times the DAP phase gate is gonna be when we know exactly what our footprint is gonna be for surveys. So what I look at is DAP phase gate for environmental is this is our footprint. I really, at that point, we don't have to refine what we're doing within it, but we need to know we're not gonna go any bigger than that. So DAP phase gate for, at least in my opinion, and I'm, and I'm sure if you talk to other recs, they'll, they'll probably agree with me to some point, but we need to know that that footprint's not gonna change. And that's really the only solid thing we need to know at DAP. Environmental you know, design can change all the way up to ps &E, but we need to have that API nailed down and we need to be ensured that that is not gonna change. Um, mobbing, for example, archeology span to go back out, um, we really don't wanna do that. They're stretched for time. Most of the time we're consulting out all of our environmental survey work through University of Oregon. They have a really tight schedule and they're booked out months in advance. So if our API changes after DAP, we may not be able to get them out for another year. So just ensuring that that footprint is pretty solid. Um, when in doubt, make it bigger. You know, it's not gonna make a difference to us as long as we stay within it. Other questions? Any questions? We have some time. Okay, Tamara. So the part, the part three is kind of what we're using to classify the project. So it can be done as early as project kickoff. And if you have a PCE determination, that can be done as early as project kickoff. So that's really classifying it between 99% of our projects, like I said, are either gonna be a programmatic CAD X or they're gonna be a regular CE. So the REC can do that part three as early as kickoff if they have sufficient information. DAP, you may not have enough by that point to know what your triggers are gonna be. When in doubt, um, a REC is gonna hold off on preparing that. Uh, if we prepare a programmatic categorical, a PCE determination way up front, and then we have one of those kickouts, and we've already obligated federal dollars for right away and those have already been expended, getting that taken care of is kind of a mess. Um, so the longer we can wait to ensure that we're not gonna have anything that's gonna trigger us back out of that, the better. But I'd say, you know, 90% of the time we can do it at project kickoff. Are our 30% plans uh, adequate for permitting purposes in you know, general? In general, they are, but the risk is that you're going to have something that's going to change significantly enough between 30% and, let's say, you know, advanced plans or that's going to kick us out of what we obligate ourselves in our permit. Um, we try to, in general, wait until at least advanced plans. There's still plenty of time in the project schedule to get your permits after that. Um, it's just easier than resubmitting and then starting that clock over. If we have 30% plans and we're pretty confident um, that things aren't going to change too much, yeah, we can definitely go ahead and submit then. One of the things I'll add to that, um, a lot of times it's a concern with completing the CE documentation, the NEPA documentation. We don't need our D or permits from DSL or CORE uh, to complete our NEPA. There are certain documents that are required attachments and those aren't. We just need to have them by ps &E. So we can submit those any time and still complete the NEPA ahead of that. If you don't have federal dollars on a project, could you, um, you, you touched on this, but what other, what, what other factors may trigger NEPA? 
So if you don't have federal dollars, we highly encourage, even on projects that don't have federal highways dollars, that you can coordinate with your rec on those. Because at any point, if federal money has become involved, then you've done federalized the entire project. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar, you're still going to be pulled underneath that umbrella. Um, an example would be is if you have another federal agency's permitting requirements that you trigger. So let's say you have a state-funded project, you're doing a bridge replacement, um, you're in a waters of the U.S., you trigger the need for a core permit. You've triggered that federal agency's NEPA requirements at that point, and they're going to be the lead for that NEPA documentation, not federal highways, because there's no federal highways involvement. And the core is going to take as much time as they need in their internal processes, and they're not really set to our schedules. So we're kind of at the mercy of their internal clock at that point. So just you know, involve your rec if you have some state-funded projects and just see what that risk level is. Um, a lot of maybe it's not the best route to go um, to do fully state-funded. Um, when you don't have that federal highways nexus, you can't use the programmatics. That's the other kind of downside to it. Um, so you don't have those shortcuts that we have in place. So, so I have a question. Yeah. Actually, I have a comment first. Um, I think the thing that we heard the most is consult with your rec. Definitely do that. Uh, that's great advice. But do know that your rec is coordinating a team of environmentalists. So give them the time that they need to go out and talk to the biologist, the wetland specialist, the cultural specialist, the noise specialist, anyone that they need to get involved. And then I would say that there is rare occasion where you may have someone on your team on the PDT that isn't in alignment with something that your rec is telling you. So my question would be, um, what would a rec do in that instance? Well, what I've done, um, I think just, you need to fully understand what each person's, I'm not gonna say motivation, but where they're standing and why. So just get all the facts. Um, Environmental disciplines do not always agree, and that's a definite. Um, we have conflicting regulatory requirements. It could be even just internal team. Like maybe you're thinking like a bridge designer is saying that, well, we do need to put a pier in the middle of the river, and it's cheaper, and it's more efficient, and construction can happen in one season instead of two. And um, we just need to evaluate. The one thing about environmental is that we, ultimately, if you're using your best judgment, you can permit anything. Um, keep that, it may take a little longer, but it's not to say that we're restricted to certain design criteria and we have to be just along that path. Um, if we have a really good argument for something that is in conflict with what we were originally are proposing from an environmental standpoint, we're willing to listen to that, we're willing to argue for it, and we're willing to permit it. So there's, it's never a closed door for environmental. Um, there's always a way through it, it just may take a little longer. Okay. Any other questions? All right, remember to use your cards if you do have any questions for Teresa and write them down and put them in the box there. Teresa, thank you so much. A lot of good information.